I'm Teresa Beanken, CEO of National Speakers Bureau Canada and Global Speakers Agency. We're one of the original speakers bureaus in North America, and we envision that the sharing of ideas inspires action to make the world a better place through bringing you expert speakers and thought leaders for your conferences, events, and training programs, whether they be in person, online, or hybrid. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. B. Kwame is a mental health expert and journalist on pop culture and diversity. She's a multi-passionate creative who uses her platforms to share stories and connect with others, centering on mental and brain health, resilience, diversity, and pop culture analysis. With a degree in health sciences from the University of Western Ontario, B. spent over a decade in the healthcare industry, working in mental health research, international health, and brain injury work before transitioning fully to writing and media. You will have seen, read, or heard her work. She's the co-host of The Cultured Show on Global News Radio, covering topics around pop culture and diversity. She's also been featured on TVO's The Agenda with Steve Pakin, City TV's City Line, CBC Radio, and The National. And she's written for Chatelaine, The Globe and Mail, McLean's Today's Parent, and more. B also produces and hosts events in the GTA on feminism in film, the celebration of natural hair, and diversity in media. She served as a board director with Taibu Community Health Center, providing primary health care and health promotion services to Black communities across the GTA. These presentations center on the stories that often aren't told, providing spaces where audiences can learn, be empowered, and find a relatable voice. Welcome, B. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you for the intro. I'm, I'm just pulling up my uh, presentation to share with you all, but I have to say it's always really interesting to hear the, the bio being read because I, I'm always just thinking about the next thing I've got to do. I don't reflect enough on what I've done. So I hear my bio and I'm like, who did all that? And it's like, oh, I did all that. I, I, I forgot. So it's a, it's a great reminder. So thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all to everybody who is here today. I just wanna make sure Teresa, you can see my screen, right? It just popped up a lot easier than it did when we tested. So I just wanna make sure. Yes, yeah. we can see both you and your visuals. Perfect, all right. Yeah, you know, this, this tech world, Zoom world, things are always a little bit uh, clunky and wrong things get clicked here and there, but we are good to go. So. I'm gonna get into my presentation called The Power and Pitfalls of Resilience. And like I mentioned, uh, you know, you've heard a bit about me already. Uh, just give me one second to see why this is not, there we go, moving along. But I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about me. So you did hear that uh, I spent over a decade in the healthcare industry working in various aspects from medical tourism to mental health to uh, supervising group homes for adults with brain injury and developmental disability. And then I transitioned into first my love of writing. And this is a love that I had since I was a child. And Robert Munch, my favorite children's book author, and now my children's favorite ch children's book author, was actually the first person to encourage me. I won a writing competition in, I wanna say grade two. And the reward was uh, the winner from each grade got to have a reception in the, in the library with Robert Munch. And he read my story and told me it was amazing. And I thought, I'm going to be a writer. My favorite author told me I'm amazing. I'm going to do this. Took a little bit of a detour to get there, but I, I made it back to, to my kind of initial love of writing. And as you heard before, I've written for places like the Globe and Mail, Chatelaine, Men's Health, Ebony, and, and many other uh, digital and print publications. I was able to transition as well into hosting radio, which is something I never thought I would do, uh, but co-hosting the Cultured Show on AM640 Toronto through Global News Radio has been incredible. Uh, we cover a lot of the hot topics through pop culture lens uh, each week, and we do interviews with amazing, amazing people. Uh, big celebrities and local people whose stories you may not hear uh, because they are not often given the types of platforms that, that we're able to share uh, with their stories. So I would say last year, my biggest winner was interviewing Anika Noni Rose, who is an actress who did the voice of Princess Tiana in The Princess and the Frog. So I was mom of the decade once my children heard me speaking with Princess Tiana. 
I've been on TV, so I've done City Line, CBC, The National, I've done The Social, I've done ET Canada and, and a few other places as well. Uh, so just being able to, again, find different ways to transition my message and find a new audience has been really, really uh, helpful for me as well. And public speaking, which is why I'm here today. So I've done everything from elementary all the way up to grad students. I've done di different conferences, worked with different organizations. And all of this wrapped up in a bow is why my mom calls me a professional big mouth. So that is the, the overall title that I use when I describe to people what I do. But let's get into why we're here today to talk about resilience. So the definition from the American Psychological Association says that resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. As much as resilience involves bouncing back from these difficult experiences, it can also involve profound personal growth. And I think that we can all recognize the, the benefits of that and the necessity of resilience living in the world that we're living in today. A few examples of resilience could be found in people who are victims of discrimination. Uh, I will say personally, with my own journey, both in healthcare and in media, dealing with a lot of racism and sexism in both industries has really helped me to de develop my own resilience as I move through spaces where I am the only, uh, the only woman, the only black person, the only black woman in a space and, and having to deal with uh, the uncomfortable moments, the negativity that comes with that and finding ways to continue to push forward. Other examples of uh, where we can find resilience are with trauma survivors. So this can be any type of trauma, people who survived uh, you know, horrific car accidents or people who have dealt with uh, some type of abuse and have worked their way through that. Uh, even people who maybe have not dealt with something on a long-term basis, but just kind of an initial traumatic event can also help you to, deliver, uh, to develop your own well of resilience as well. And resilience, we have heard the term lot in the direction of our children during this pandemic, especially with discussions um, around uh, schooling and, and safety and whether school is in or whether school is out uh, and, and what that all means and, and honing in on the resilience of children. So it's funny, I did a speaking engagement a couple of weeks ago for a summer camp for girls uh, between the ages of eight and 12. And I spoke to them a little bit about resilience and asked them if they knew what it meant. And a few of the younger ones shook their heads saying no. And then one said, oh, but that's how they describe us in the news talking about COVID. And then the other kids were like, oh yeah. So even children are understanding that this label of resilience is being put on them as we move through the pandemic and all the changes that come with that. And again, you can also think of other examples probably in your own lives, just even dealing with just stress. You've seen all the different, the list of jobs I have, and I've got two young children. Uh, so just the stress of managing everything and keeping all the balls moving and keeping things going, uh, having never ending to do lists and just feeling that stress and having to manage that is also a way that we build resilience too. So there are some pros and cons to resilience that I wanna think about as we kind of transition into a different way of looking at this. The pros are with resilience, obviously we can build internal strength, we can build coping mechanisms. Those things can help prepare us for future challenges that we may face. Uh, I would say, you know, thinking about my own experiences uh, with racism and sexism in different work environments and dealing with things in one area, it prepares me if I have to deal with it again in another area. So it helps you to kind of build your armor and, and build the ways that you will cope with, with these things that you are faced with dealing with. And a lot of research shows that resilience can help us to avoid health conditions related to stress. Uh, research has shown that people who do not have good resilience suffer a lot more from chronic stress uh, symptoms and issues. So resilience is seen as a positive way to help to manage uh, our stress levels. When we think about cons, I wanna start there with this idea around managing stress because I, I couldn't find really any significant um, data on this, but anecdotally, just thinking about myself and speaking with other people, resilience can lead to stress levels as well. And I feel that we don't really think about that that much. Uh, using myself as an example, when I am uh, you know, preparing to do a job, whether it was healthcare, whether it's in media, 
You've got to know your stuff. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready to go. And on top of that, I also need to have my resilience set to a level where I am, I've got my armor or I've got my preparation or I've got my coping mechanism set up for kind of that inevitable moment when I'm going to deal with something negative in that space. And that builds up a sense of stress as well, that I then need to use other things, other tools like self-care and, and other things to help to manage. So I kind of see this idea of resilience being good or bad for stress as kind of two sides of the same coin, and it just depends on which side it falls. But also with resilience, it can make us become really accustomed to adversity. And that's really not fair a lot of the time because it can lead to neglect and acceptance of oppressions and marginalizations just personally and throughout society. And what I mean by that is, again, if we're thinking about racism, we're thinking about sexism, we're thinking about any other type of discrimination that just seems to become part and parcel of what you have to deal with as a woman executive, what you have to deal with as a minority or as a, uh, you know, a racialized person in a certain space. The, the responsibility falls on the individual to build up their resilience to deal with that adversity instead of thinking about should they even really have to deal with this adversity in the first place. And it becomes very easy to just, you know, kind of tap somebody on the shoulder and say, well, just buck up, you know, that's just how it is. So your responsibility is to build your resilience so that you can make it through. And this, in my mind, the theory that I'm kind of working through with this presentation and some other work I'm doing is the fact that Resilience becomes a crutch and that becomes the pitfall of resilience because it allows oppression, it allows discrimination, it allows all of these other challenges to continue to germinate and pollinate and become an acceptable part of society. Because again, the responsibility is on the victim to build their resilience. And that doesn't seem like a great way to, to access or to utilize resilience to me. Now, if we think about this through a different view, some questions I have here is, what if we didn't have to be so resilient all the time? And thinking about how does resilience uphold oppression? And what if we shifted the lens to assess the things that we have to be resilient against instead of looking at uh, judging the person and their level of resilience against it? So again, with this presentation that I did for this uh, youth summer camp, I was speaking to them about things like body positivity and things like the Black Lives Matter movement and, and stating to them that yes, we do have to be resilient when our bodies look differently. We do have to be resilient when we are of a different culture and we're bringing those things into maybe a space that is not so receptive or is not used to these types of differences, but we shouldn't have to. I mean, I was thinking about just this very, um, off the cuff conversation that I was having with these girls. And I was thinking, you know, my daughters are a bit younger than them, but I don't want my daughters to have to deal with the resilience of, of, you know, body discrimination or racism or sexism. I don't want them to have to deal with that. So yes, they do have to learn to be resilient in the world that we're in, but can we not push back on the other side and shift some of that? So these are not things that we have to be resilient against. And this requires us to uh, take on more energy and more effort than people may be comfortable with doing in the moment. So I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But these again are just some questions to think about in terms of how do we shift the lens instead of uh, you know, priding someone on their resilience and that kind of being a silent acceptance of the thing that they have had to contend with and shifting that to look at that thing they've had to contend with and say, how do we eliminate that so they don't have to do that mental work of being resilient? So some life lessons that go along with this is thinking about the fact that quite simply, this is something my parents have said to me uh, for ages, life isn't fair, uh, bad things happen to good people, uh, and, and there are just some things that are unavoidable in life, uh, either because this is just what comes our way or this is kind of the scenario we've created for ourselves. Again, thinking about myself and, and the different things I do on any given day, I'm preparing for a radio show or setting up my, my bedroom set for a TV taping and then finishing a draft and then picking the kids up from daycare. And it's just, you're doing it all over again. And that is something that I've kind of created for myself and it's unavoidable. So yes, I do have to build my resilience to be able to go through that because that's kind of what I've chosen for myself and that's just the way it is. The problem is relying on resilience makes us think that many things are unavoidable. 
discrimination, bigotry, all of these different things become unavoidable because we are too focused on building up our resilience to address them. So these just become things that we just figure are just going to be part of the world that we're in. And again, we put the stress on ourselves or we put that stress on other people to build up resilience to deal with it. And then we've got to consider how celebrating that resilience upholds oppression. Again, like I was saying, if we put so much focus on the individual who has to build up that inner strength and we never put that same focus on that oppression they're facing, then we're not really changing anything and we're not actually helping that person. And that person could be yourself, thinking about yourself and the ways that you might speak to yourself about building resilience and the resilience you may need, or it may be the ways that we speak with other people, maybe the ways that we speak with our children uh, or, or our coworkers or anybody else who's kind of in our circle. So we really need to start to flip that a little bit. And instead of immediately jumping to the reaction of, well, how's their resilience or how's my resilience? Let's think about maybe should we direct some of this to getting rid of that thing we have to be resilient against. So again, before we compliment somebody's resilience, and even this is internally as well, for ourselves to say to ourselves, we have to look at what's on the other side. And I do a lot of talks about diversity and inclusion and anti-oppression work. And for people who are seeking to be allies in different ways, people always want to know, what can I do? What, what would help? What makes a difference as an ally? And I think this is one of those areas that uh, might be a little bit easier for people to digest uh, in terms of trying to make a difference. We can kind of crystallize anti-oppression work into challenging our acceptance of resilience. So you might think to yourself, what have I had to be resilient against? And have some of these things just been kind of unavoidable? Have these things kind of been uh, situations of my own making or just kind of the way my life is or the traumas that have come my way? Or are some of these things actually things that we have just kind of generally accepted as the way the world is, but maybe we shouldn't be doing that. And we can direct that challenge personally within ourselves, within the people in our circles or societally. And this is when now we can speak up for ourselves or for other people and we can challenge things. So some of the uh, points that I was saying to the young girls when I was speaking with them in terms of what they can do to make a change were things like if you hear somebody make a joke about the way somebody's body looks, you can speak up and kind of put a stop to that and say, I didn't think that was funny. Uh, or, you know, if you see somebody who's being made fun of because of their culture or the food that they bring for lunch or anything like that, you can maybe be the person to welcome them into your friend group so they feel uh, welcomed and they feel that they belong just the way they are. So even thinking about these young children that I was speaking with and giving them these tools to then be able to be kind of that, that stop gap between uh, kind of the the injurious act of whatever it is, the making fun or, or the racism or the sexism or the fat phobia and that person who's going to receive it and then have to build up their resilience. Telling these children, you can be, you can interrupt that. You can be in the middle of that so that injurious uh, act doesn't get to that person. They don't ever have to build that resilience because you have made a way to stop it and you have reflected back onto that other person where maybe they might think about it and realize, you know, I probably shouldn't say that or I probably shouldn't do that. And this other person on the other end maybe doesn't even know that this situation has happened, but you have now saved them at least one chance, one time of having to now go back and build that resilience, add another layer of that armor or figure out another coping mechanism to deal with uh, some type of negative behavior that comes their way. So there are ways that we can do that to challenge uh, when we think about challenging what people have to be resilient against and finding our way to kind of interrupt that flow before it gets to that person who's having to build that resilience for themselves. So some takeaways are again to honor the strength that resilience gives us. Again, it's not that there's anything wrong with resilience. Resilience is necessary. Uh, resilience is helpful. Resilience is something that we need to be able to survive and get through life. But we also do have to remember that resilience is not our only response. When something happens, and, and this is something I've been working on with myself, uh, you know, somebody maybe makes a comment or there's something that happens, uh, a microaggression or, or something that 
makes me feel like, oh, okay, I've got to prepare myself for the next time this happens. I have stopped myself from just accepting that. And I have instead thought of another response to say, okay, well, what am I going to do about this? Am I just going to accept it and say, all right, the work is on me now to be more resilient? Or am I going to challenge it a little bit? Am I going to find a way to push back, uh, whether that's me directly or whether that's getting help from another party to address the situation? Am I going to do something to push that energy back onto uh, that thing that I was going to originally have to build resilience for? And remember that pushing back builds strength as well. So it's not that you're resilient or you're weak. Uh, it doesn't go that way. It's not, it's not that much of a, a black and white kind of binary. Pushing back and being able to challenge and, and say for yourself, I will not accept that. So this is where this stops because I am not accepting this behavior. I am not accepting what you have said. I am not accepting the responsibility of having to build resilience against this because this should have not ever happened. Or whether that means, like I said before, being that person to interrupt that with somebody else and pushing back in another situation where you see something unfair happening or you've heard something uh, that could then have a negative impact on someone else that they will have to build resilience for. That is strength as well. There is strength in pushing back and there is strength in being able to say, uh, I refuse to accept this and I'm pushing that energy back and now giving you the responsibility to figure out how you are going to change. It's not my responsibility to be resilient against this anymore. It's your responsibility to figure out why that was wrong and what you're going to do to make sure you never do that again. So we can find ways to push back and, and exemplify our strength in that way as well, as opposed to just kind of accepting these things as rote and, and normalized and perpetuating oppressions and discrimination that continue to happen because we just continue to build our resilience. So we can do that for ourselves. We can do that for other people that we know. We can do that on a larger scale within society. And I think it's just really important to think about resilience from another perspective and think about when we look at the pitfalls of this, what are we actually enabling? And do we want to continue to enable that? Or do we want to find a way to, to balance the scales a little bit and make things a little bit easier for ourselves and, and other people as well? And there's so much more I could say about this. We've got 20 minutes and you know, there was a lot more that we could cover and talk about, but I wanna thank you all for your time and your attention. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll be back with Teresa. Wonderful. Thank you so much, B, for sharing both sides, as you say, the uh, the pitfalls and the potential of resilience. Certainly, um, uh, it's an important skill set to have, but it's also something that we need to think twice about. Why do we have to create it in the first place? So thank you. Thank you. Um, we welcome any of your uh, questions uh, coming in, and so I'm happy to share those with uh, B to extend uh, the session. And there's one question about um, kind of uh, <clears throat> language that you can use. So along the lines of what you're talking about, uh, sometimes someone will say, you know, I'm so impressed with how resilient you are considering everything that you've been going through. Um, what kind of language would you suggest um, that makes it more of an acknowledgement of what someone might be going through and how that could change? I think part of it would be, instead of making it a statement, making it a question. So asking that person, instead of assuming that they feel good about having to have built this resilience up against whatever is happening in their lives, maybe it's a question uh, of phrasing it that way and saying, you know, and even admitting like, I would might I might say to a friend, you know, from my view, from my perspective, it looks like you're, you know, you've you've been so resilient, you've really been handling this well. But how does it feel for you? And I think that that is kind of what's missing sometimes, where we just make the assumption that this person is okay, they're moving through things, they're dealing with it, they must be good, they must be proud of themselves for resilience. But I think having that question to let that person speak about how they feel, then will open the door to say, all right, maybe we need to discuss this a little bit differently. Thank you, that's a helpful perspective. Uh, we have a question from Anna that um, references, uh, you shared with us your work experience. Can you tell us a bit about your education too, in terms of how you created a path for yourself in working in mental health? Mm -hmm. So uh, my mom is a nurse, so she's the one who kind of inspired me directly and indirectly. You know, I mentioned the whole Robert Munch thing and, and that I love to write, but my parents came to Canada from Jamaica and they thought writing was, uh, 
you know, that was the fun thing that I did when I was done my homework, but that wasn't really going to be like a real job. I needed to make sure I got a good solid job. So my other love was science and, and healthcare and kind of being inspired by the work my mom did. So I did my degree in health sciences, uh, my honors degree at Western. I did post-secondary studies in health promotion uh, when I moved to Toronto at York and at George Brown College. And everything I have done, so that's, that's kind of the education that supported me through my healthcare career with everything that I've done through writing and media, it's essentially been self-taught. Uh, a way that I deal with stress is to write. So when I was working in a very stressful agency with adults with brain injury, I went back to start a blog just to have a way to kind of get my mind off of work during the week and, and write about things that were just interesting to me. And that's kind of where my, my freelance writing career took off. Uh, I did get accepted to a fellowship program at Yale in 2016. Uh, so I was able to go to Yale uh, in the summer and, and study with other digital storytellers and use that to hone my craft as well. But uh, pretty much I've been, I've been winging it. I've been winging it when it comes to the media stuff and just kind of learning as I go and, and having great friends and mentors and supports that, that have helped me through, so. Hopefully that answers. But it looks like it's been working for you with a strong foundation, congrats. <laughs> um, there's another question about um, uh, resilient in the workplace. And can you give an example of a common situation that perhaps is being too frequently accepted where you know team members in a workplace could speak up and try to change things? Mm -hmm. I think that what I've seen through even a lot of conversations that I've had through different uh, engagements that have come through the NSB with different organizations and corporations has been around the idea of microaggressions in the workplace. And this could be a whole, I mean, it, it is a whole presentation that I have uh, to do around microaggressions, but just thinking about those seemingly, seemingly um, innocent comments that somebody might make uh, where somebody is complimented for speaking so well, or somebody is asked, well, where are you from? Because the assumption is, uh, if they don't look like everybody else, they must have been born somewhere else. Uh, or just these types of comments uh, or actions where especially women will note being in a boardroom in a meeting and they start to speak and then a man starts speaking over them and everybody turns to listen to the man and they don't even realize that this person has spoken over the woman in the room. So dealing with microaggressions uh, is something that I have found through my own personal experience and through research and doing work around talking about microaggressions is that it has been so accepted and these are the types of things that people have to build resilience against, uh, but these are also the things that people are starting to push back on and that uh, different executives as they are looking more into diversity and equity and inclusion are learning about these things and how they present in the workplace. And so people are also being proactive with saying, how do we have these discussions in the workplace and how do we make sure that we have the proper metrics and things in place to to curb that or to at least make people feel safe to bring it up if something happens because those were the types of things that were uh, kind of going unreported because you just figure as the person who receives it this is just what i'm going to have to deal with and i'm just going to have to be resilient but that is really starting to change in, in many organizational levels as well Thank you for uh, this uh, shift in perspective and some of the language and tools that we can use as well as um, be more aware of uh, what's happening, whether it's um, the way we're dealing with things or uh, people that we're working with and living with. So um, I can see some of the comments in the chat. Wow, yes, yes, thank you. Um, new perspectives to think about. This is amazing. Oh. Um, so thank you so much, B, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for everyone for being here and, and yeah, for the amazing questions and support. So thank you so much. Wonderful. And uh, yes, we appreciate uh, everyone who's joined us today. Um, we will have a follow up uh, recording in an email that should come to you within the next couple of days. And uh, this is our last session of this season. So we hope to see everyone again in September where we will return um, with this uh, focus on uh, personal and professional development and our engaged webinar series. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the summer and uh, we are still here. Uh, 24 hours a day to help you with uh, any of your speaker and event programming needs. Thanks again. Thanks.